Well, good morning. There's about 65 seconds left of morning, so <laughs> um, welcome. It's really great to have you here at Grace Lutheran Church. Uh, this is, well, I guess technically September is still summer, but uh, here in the, in the last days of summer, we're really glad to have you here, and I uh, hope that you enjoy your lunch and enjoy the talk, and again, welcome to Grace. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Pastor Matt. Yes, thank you. So we have quite a few announcements. I'll try to get through them pretty quickly so we can get to our speaker, Pat. Um, we wanted to thank our sponsor for today, Betty Thomas. Is Betty here? Hi, Betty. Thank you for sponsoring today's talk. It helps, uh, sponsorships help offset you know, the cost of the room rental for Grace and the refreshments, so we really appreciate that. Thank you, Betty. Uh, mark your calendars, September 7th, uh, Diana Scott, Diana's here, hi. She will be in our bookshop signing uh, Forgotten Corner History of, of Oakland Mill, and that's September 7th, 10.30 to 12. Uh, we provide free coffee for people, and it's just a nice fireside chat with an author, so keep that in mind. Um, Covalent Spirits, History Shaken and Stirred. Uh, that's going to be 6 p.m. same day, September 7th. Also, our big uh, fundraiser, our BBB event, uh, Bluegrass Bourbon and Bocce, will be at the Union Mills Homestead on September 10th. I um, believe that's an afternoon, starts around 4, four o'clock uh, at the homestead. And then next month, our BLT is going to be at Manchester Cigar Industry. Joe Getty will be speaking about that history, and that should be a great talk. I think Lynn wanted to say a few words about the BLTs and 2024 schedule. Thank you, Lynn. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you for your regular participation in the Box Lunch Talks. It's always fantastic to see your face coming in the room and thank you. But a number of you would mention a talk you might be interested in giving or a talk you'd like to hear. And so we are setting up the 2024 calendar now and we would love to hear from you if you're willing to give a talk. And believe me, if you told me you're willing, you will hear from me. Um, and if you have any ideas for things you'd like us to present, let us know so we can get the 24 schedule finalized. And thanks again to everybody for being here. And thank you, Lynn, for everything that you do for the BLTs. It's a lot of work, a big commitment every week, and we really appreciate you too. Thank you, Lynn. So I would like to, uh, Pat, we're almost there, I promise. I'd like to introduce to you um, a, a recent hire at the Historical Sia, Laura Banker. Laura, can you please come up? Laura's serving as our new Outreach and Events Director, and she'd like to say a few words of welcome and hello to the group. Yeah, thank you everyone for showing up. This is gonna be a great talk, so we're looking forward to it. And uh, if anybody has any questions, please send me an email, uh, call me, whatever you need to do. Um, I'm looking for, you know, ideas and things like that for the Historical Society, so my door is always open. Thank you. Pat Greenwald is, a retired, is retired as Director of uh, Gifted and Talented Education at Howard County Public Schools. However, retirement is not a word I would use to describe Pat. She is a preservation activist who helped save and revive the historic Sykesville Colored Schoolhouse and two other schools. While serving on the Sykesville Historic District Commission, Greenwald led the effort in the early 2000s to restore the historic Sykesville Schoolhouse in, to its 1904 appearance. Today, the facility is used to teach children about the past through field trips, tours, and special events. Pat serves on the board of the Howard County Historical Society. Her work in Howard County has been similar. She advocated preservation of the Pfeiffer's Corner Schoolhouse, which dates to the 1860s. 
when its original property was bought by a developer. Her efforts there led to a move of one of, of the one-room schoolhouse in Rockburn Branch Park in Elkridge in 2003. She's also instrumental in repurposing a Quaker school in Ellicott City into a children's museum. Greenwald is a graduate of Northwestern University. She's also a master gardener. Last year, Pat received the Light of Carroll Educator Award from Carroll County Public Library. In 2018, she was inducted into the Howard County Women's Hall of Fame. Can we have a round of applause for Pat, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a little bit of exaggeration in some of that. I went to a basketball game at Northwestern once, but I graduated from Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, where the Lincoln-Douglas debates were held. That was our claim to fame. And then got my master's at the University of Colorado Boulder. But Northwestern is not part of my past. I'm not sure where that came from. I like Northwestern. Um, also, that all was very glowing, but it didn't say that I was an ace at technology. Last night, I could not get my PowerPoint onto a thumb drive, and I talked with Microsoft and Apple until about 1 in the morning. At 6, I got up and started rewriting it. At about 8 o'clock, my grandson from California came in from the airport, walked up to my computer, and got it right on. So you need a kid. I wish I'd had him at 8.30 last night. But if I lose my words during this, it's because I'm half asleep. Okay. So we will get going with a tale of three schoolhouses, the three I've been involved with working on. And actually, I should say there were four schoolhouses. When I was a child in LaGrange, Illinois, my mother was always my brownie and my Girl Scout leader, and she loved nature. And every year, she would take us to the Little Red Schoolhouse, which is on Long John Slough. And it was filled with microscopes and binoculars and reference books. And we would just have a great time exploring nature at the Little Red Schoolhouse. And I think that's what just gave me the schoolhouse bug and why, through the years, I have always looked for schoolhouses that needed a little bit of love. Um, I cut, when I took this picture offline, I cut off the huge modern educational facility, which was built about six years ago, right next to the Little Red Schoolhouse. I kind of like the old schoolhouse better. Well, today, we'll be looking at these three schoolhouses, the Pfeiffer's Corner Schoolhouse, which is in Elkridge, Maryland, the Second Ellicott Quaker School, which is up the hill from the flood area in Ellicott City. It's still in historic Ellicott City, up across from the old decommissioned courthouse. And we'll spend most of the time on the historic Sykesville Colored Schoolhouse because this is a Carroll County group. And that's the schoolhouse that my heart is really in. So this is Pfeiffer's Corner after it was moved and restored. Actually, my students had advocated to have it saved. They were on a tour of historical sites in Howard County with historian Joetta Cram. And as we left our school, the first thing we passed was this tumble-down shack. And she said, that was a one-room schoolhouse, and it's about to be torn down. Well, the kids didn't pay much attention to her the rest of the day because they were all ready to get out and save that schoolhouse. And it took them two years, their seventh and eighth grade social studies classes I worked with as a GT coordinator. And eventually they did raise the funds and were able to get it moved. It sat under tarps for about 12 years while it was disintegrating. And then they finally, the county did restore it. But they have never really put it to much use. It was constructed in 1883, the community around it was um, mainly German immigrants, hence the name Pfeiffers. The Pfeiffers are one of the families, and they had given the land. And then when it was consolidated into a larger school in 1933, it was closed. It was moved into by a family home. They put a stairway, or a floor and a stairway up so that they could have some bedrooms. They had like eight children 
in a tiny little one-room schoolhouse. Um, when the kids were over there looking at it before restoration, and the students were over there, we found that newspapers from World War II had been used for insulation. And they were in perfect condition until we pulled them out of the walls and exposed them to the air, and they just kind of disintegrated. In 1970, the family that lived in it, um, the kids had grown up and left, and it just stood and was abandoned. And then it was 88 when the seventh graders decided that um, they were going to... Seventh graders are very determined people. And when they want to do something, they're going to do it. And Howard County kept telling me, get those kids off the streets with their placards. We didn't have a single cut child out there with a placard, but they were calling the press quite a bit. And then it wasn't until 2004 when it was rededicated and it was funny because the county wanted me to call the kids to the rededication. They were living from one end of the country to the other by then. They'd all long since graduated from college and moved away. And many of them took careers, though, that had to do with preservation or um, the law or the government. And we just have a couple of pictures of students at the school. You can see that it was Definitely a school of only Caucasian faces. I counted here 39 students, two teachers, in a little, tiny, one-room school. And the male teacher you see in the back row, row was named George Bush. He was a German immigrant himself, and he lost his job this year, 1921, because of all the anti-German sentiment in the county. And this was just before it closed. And this small woman to the far, far near left is somebody who helped us a great deal, Marian Matthews, who was the last teacher at the school. And she helped the kids with a lot of their historic research. This is what it looked like when we found it. Here, it's being raised onto blocks so it can be put onto trucks. It could not stay where it was because that lot was um, destined for development. There were three huge trees in the back that had dates and names carved into them, big oak trees, and they stayed. So the students who went there kind of live on the top branches of the tree. We had to put it on two trucks to get it down Maryland 108. Um, Otherwise, we were going to have to pay to have every power line that went over the street lowered, and it was less expensive to take the roof off than to lower all the power lines. And the kids stood on the front lawn of Howard High School to watch it go by. And the county had given two rights, special allowances to Route 108 that day, for the schoolhouse to move down 108 and for a triathlon to run up 108. So the schoolhouse ran into the athletes. It pulled to the side. All the kids came back to my house for breakfast. And uh, then we went back out and watched it go by. And my mother had the sense to turn around and take a picture of the kids instead of looking at the school as it went by. And so I think that's a cool, cool picture of their reaction. And then in 2004, it was finally restored. And, um, there were a lot of things that I would not have done in the restoration. Like this big labyrinth of accessibility, you know, having it go back and forth rather than one 2% rate ramp. And this was the last time I was inside. The county is only using it. It sits in a park. And if there is thunder during a ball game, the kids go in there to be safe, but they're not really using it for much. So I was very disappointed. I had collected a lot of materials and furniture that was period. And when I went in to take this picture, um, most of it was broken because the kids kept bouncing their balls in there. Then we'll move to Ellicott City and we'll move forward about 20 years. Um, about 10 years ago, two of us had the idea that this old Quaker school 
should have more done with it than just kind of decaying and falling apart while being used to house donations, material donations to the historical society. It wasn't even the correct you know, humidity or temperature or anything. It was just a storage place and was in pretty rotten condition. It had a long history. We believe the Ellicott's built it in 1790. They believed in education, and education was for everyone. Um, the children of slaves were educated there, the children of some of the Native Americans, and the girls as well as the boys. The girls and the boys were usually in the same building, but the girls were on one floor and the boys on the other. Um, they had to know how to read and write and do simple arithmetic before they were allowed to enter the school. So there was a little class division because the kids whose parents couldn't teach them those skills then could not enter the school. Um, we know it was closed as a school in 1812 because they did bring soldiers from the battle in Baltimore um, to the school. The hospital was established there. We know that in 1820, the boys moved back in. The other school, which was down near the mills off of Main Street, had gotten too crowded, so they left it for the girls. So the boys could be the ones to climb what's called Mount Misery in Ellicott City, up off of Main Street. And so the boys only attended this school. And then by the 1830s, the new school on the other side of um, Main Street had been built. And so it was no longer in use as a school. Various families lived in it, bought it over the years, until the 1940s when the county acquired it. It was used for selective service, it was used for the volunteer firemen, just lots of uses, mainly as a storage facility. Um, and then in 1984, they leased it to the Historical Society, our main building is right next door in the old Presbyterian Church, and that is now the Museum of Howard County History. And, and then for 10 years, two of us kept bothering the county and bothering our own board, saying that we really wanted to do something with the building to make more use of it. And we went to the Children's Museum. We went to all the museums here in Carroll County and uh, Rose Manor in Frederick and the museum down in Montgomery County. And we said, all those counties have these, why don't we? And so we kind of shamed them into it. It took us, once we got permission to do it, it took us another six years because we could only get so much money a year. So one year we kind of stabilized the outside, one year we put systems in, one year we put on a new roof, and little by little we got it done. And some of you, if you know Ellicott City, may be familiar with this building. This is what it looked like when we started. This is one side of it, where the boys would go up those tall um, granite steps into the building. The building was known for all the wrought iron on it. The owners had a daughter who was a Carmelite nun in New Orleans. They visited her and decided they needed wrought iron on their house as well. So the wrought iron was, the foundry was in Baltimore. But this is what it looked like. But see that balcony up on top? If you blew, you felt like it was gonna come down. That, the enclosure of that balcony happened in the 1970s. And this is what was behind it these wonderful old windows. One of the windows had been turned into a door to get out on the balcony, but we restored it back into a window again. And the old fishtail siding there, all that was lost to that wonderful 1950s extension. And this is what the other side of the hill looked like. This is where we can have children actually enter because it is on grade for ADA regulations. And you can see that the building had lost its symmetry. It was supposed to be symmetrical. But the one side had been changed. You see that little pop-out behind that white side? That's what was in that pop-out. So that had to go. And basically, the whole place was pretty much a mess. There was this old carpeting that was glued down on all the old floors. And it really smelled bad in there. So we had a lot of time between 
years that we were able to do things. So we started market testing different programs that we could do with kids. We would have about one a month where the kids would come to the Historical Society on a Saturday morning and have an experience. And this is one of them, a little tea party. Tea party became very popular. It was a pain. It was a lot of work. And then to get ready, we had to decide exactly what our focus was. We decided we were going to look at the era when the mills were most active, so 1790 to 1830, which were the years it would have been in use as a school and the mills were at their height. And then we decided that the four interior rooms would represent four of the parts of the social studies curriculum, um, education, family life, industry, and commerce. The last one, of the, the five strands is transportation, so we thought we could just tell the kids they got on a bus to get there. Um, and then we also decided to add on an, an 1804 garden out in front. We found an 1804 seed catalog and we're buying those same plants for the front of the building. And then we needed donations of a lot of the furniture for each of the rooms, so we just put it out to the membership and we were amazed at the amount of things that we got. We only had to spend about $2,000 on antiques. And I got to go antiquing again. My old house, my own house was built in 1720, and I didn't have any place to put any more finds in it. So I was really thrilled I had an excuse to go shopping. And when anybody, any of the dealers up in Pennsylvania found out that we were from Ellicott City and they knew about the floods, they felt sorry for us and gave us a big discount. And the community really got involved. The picture of the gentleman is Dr. Mark Fradkin, who volunteered to do all the furnishing that we had to have built, like the benches for our schoolroom, the counter for the store, a bookcase. And he did it all for cost and just, just did masterful work. And got a lot of people in my garden club sewing. Here she's making the curtains. Another one of the people in my garden club made four quilts for us all vintage fabric from that era. And these two girls, as their silver project for Girl Scouts, made reproductions of all the toys. The rule in the museum is kids can touch everything. So we didn't want a lot of you know, period toys and break them, so the girls made reproductions and really did an incredible job. Now they're working on it. They're there's Gold Award. They're also doing a curriculum for a badge. And these are the rooms as they look today. This is the great room. The Quaker school room with the most uncomfortable desks in the world, but they're what the Quakers had. The kids could never fall asleep. And then Ellicott's General Store. The first thing the Ellicott's built even before the school was their general store which, you know, since they owned the mill, they kind of controlled life pretty much in the town. And then our 1804 garden. The flowers along the walk are zinnia tenifolia, which was the native zinnia that was available at that time. And right in front of the building, it's mainly herbs, and we use them a lot in our curriculum for the kids who come. And this is what it looks like today. And I didn't have a finished picture of this. I've got to get to Ellicott City and take one. This is that other side, once those neat old windows had been revealed again. The men are up there prepping the walls to put the fishtails back on. They wanted to have some insulation in there, so they took them off and numbered them. They were putting them back on. But I wish, you know, in the pictures, you just can't tell how different it really was. So this is what, what it is today. And then we will move across the river into Sykesville. And this is the historic Sykesville Colored Schoolhouse. And let me tell you one thing about its name. Okay. I knew that the original name had been the Sykesville Colored Schoolhouse. And I was very uncomfortable with that. 
And I knew that in Hartford County, they had put the word historic in front of a colored schoolhouse's name to maybe explain things. But I was asked to speak about the schoolhouse and what we were doing at the Martin Luther King Day breakfast at Martin's West. And I had, there were about 500 people there, and I asked for a show of hands who thought it should be called the colored schoolhouse or if we should get rid of that word. Everybody thought, no, you have to have the original name. And um, some of the teenagers in the community were not happy. I told them, go talk to your grandmas. I, I actually, some of them came in just waving their hands at me. They were so angry about it. And it was the day after Simon Cowell had, been, had voted Jennifer Hudson off of American Idol. And I didn't know how to react with these kids. And I said, what did you think about Jennifer getting voted off last night? And then all their anger went to Simon and not me. <laughs> By the 1830s, an African-American community had developed in Sykesville up on a hill above the town. The town was actually in the Howard County side of the town. The hill was on the Carroll County side, and it became an African-American community, mainly because the railroad had gone through, and the B&O wanted some people to stay to repair the tracks going back into Baltimore if there was an issue, or even going further west. And so they decided to stay in Sykesville. Well, you know, they weren't really welcome in the town of Sykesville, so they started this community on the top of the hill, which would probably now be the prime property in Sykesville. The views are beautiful. Um, it's called the Bottoms, um, which I had a little trouble with, but even the kids who live there refer to it as the Bottoms. And over time, as people were manumitted, they also went to live in this community because it was you know, the local black community. My house was a Dorsey home, and when they moved to Kentucky in 1814, they manumitted all of their slaves. And a lot of the people who live in this community, even today, are named Dorsey. And this just shows the map at the time. Just before the flood, you see most of the businesses are on the Howard County side, and there are some houses and farms on the Carroll side. And in 1868, the flood came through. The land in Carroll was a little bit higher, so everything was rebuilt on the Carroll side. Including a school in 1883, and this school was um, first through 11th grade. There was no kindergarten, there was no 12th grade at the time. Elementary school was one through seven, and then there were four years of high school, eight through 11. But it's hard to see, but they were all Caucasian faces. Well, some of the men in the community wanted a schoolhouse for their kids. And they hitched a wagon and went up to see the school commissioners in Westminster and asked for a school for their children. And, you know, like legend would say, they were told no way. Well, the commissioners agreed. Yes, they should have a school. They bought an acre of land. And um, the land was purchased from the man who, two years later, became the first mayor of Sykesville. And I thought it was a brave thing for him to do. And then I realized that the acre of land is a very steep hillside. So he was a farmer. He couldn't grow anything on that acre of land. So he got a couple hundred dollars for it. And this very simple school was erected. They asked for the school the first week of June. And we have records that it was there by September because they moved desks from a school in Daisy used desks from a white school in Daisy over to the schoolhouse. So it had to have been there, but it didn't open until January. And I suspect that the issue was that there was no, you know, women were the teachers back then. There was no woman of color in Sykesville who was literate, who could teach there. 
So they finally found somebody, a series of somebodies, who were willing to walk from wherever they lived in Baltimore to Camden Yards to get on the train, take the train out to Sykesville, and then climb up the hill to the schoolhouse. The graduates tell us that often the teachers put their heads down behind the desk and fell asleep. And the boys went outside and played marbles, and the girls got angry with them and stayed in and tried to teach the little kids. These are three of our students, and this picture has made the rounds. I'm sure you've seen this before. It's, it was a little, like, one and a half by two inch picture that, um, that May Dorsey, the young lady in the middle there, gave me. And I used it on a few things, and I guess there was no copyright because it's been used on everything now. I'm amazed when I see it popping up. But this is three of the Dorsey children. And the older bout boy is Warren Dorsey, who many of you are familiar with. And then the younger brother, Emerson, who um, died at a young age of 70-something, which for a Dorsey is pretty young. Warren lived to a, almost 102. And May was 98 when she died. OK, when the kids would come in, the first thing they would do would stop at the water bucket. There was no school for children of color in Western Howard at the time, so Howard County kids had a far walk. They had to walk from wherever they lived to the bridge in Sykesville, cross the bridge, and then go up the hill. So they were probably pretty thirsty by the time they got there. They would stop at the water bucket, take a drink. We hear that the boys drank directly out of the dipper, which the girls did not like. They were supposed to make a little fold a little paper cup. And then they would begin with morning devotions. I asked Dr. Ecker if it was okay that we put this sign up in this Courier and Ives print up in the schoolhouse, because all the one-room schoolhouses at the time had it. And he said, yeah, it's you know, history. Of course it can go up. So the kids would do their morning devotions. They had to recite a Bible verse. Um, three kids every day had to recite one. And you couldn't recite one that somebody had already said that day. So you had to have at least three in mind. And whoever went first always said Jesus wept. And so then, you know, you had to have two besides Jesus wept ready to go. And then they would get busy with their academics, their three R's. This was kind of funny. I, the um, Dorsey's told us that they used Elson readers, and I misunderstood when I found Searson readers online. I thought, oh, this is what he meant. So I got all the Searson readers from the pre-primers right through seventh grade, and then found out that they had Elsons. Um, they would stop for lunch. The kids who lived right on the hill could run up the hill for lunch. They had an hour, and usually they had chores when they went home. The kids who lived a distance would bring their lunch in a bucket, which is usually a bucket that syrup had come in. And um, they weren't black like this one. They were kind of covered with labels and things. But they would bring their lunch in that. And they say that every day they had syrup sandwiches. That is what the poor subsided on at the time. Um, they were embarrassed that they had lumpy bread because their mothers made the bread, and the white kids were getting that nice rainbow bread down from the store. Well, no wonder these people were healthy. They were eating whole grain bread. But the syrup they put on it was nothing but um, high fructose corn syrup. So, you know, that kind of countered the effect of the bread. Oh, and then the one time they would have to play. Um, you know, it didn't take them a whole hour to eat their syrup sandwiches, so they would get to play the rest of the time. And the kids who went home for lunch, if they finished their chores, could come down and have a little playtime as well. They did have a break once during the morning to go out and visit um, Aunt Sally and Uncle John. You know, they had two outhouses, and I think that's where we get the expression, you know, the John. The boys would say, I want to go visit my Uncle John. And the girls would say, I need to visit my dear Aunt Sally. And they would go out and use the facilities. But they did have a break once in the morning when everybody would go out. And then in 1939, it finally closed. 
It had been actually closing for about five years. They started by sending the seventh graders to Johnstown, and then the the next, or Johnsville, and then the next year the sixth graders went, and then the fifth, and finally they took the youngest kids all at once. And the Johnsville school was about four and a half miles away. No bus was provided, and so they had to walk four and a half miles each way. And again, with the lumpy bread and that walk, that probably explains some of the longevity in the community. Warren Dorsey calculated that by the time he graduated from high school, um, and he had come up here for high school, but had still had to walk to Johnsville to get the bus, but he figured he had walked 10,000 miles to get educated through 11th grade. And then it was converted into a family home. If any of you know Hanky Norris, who for many years was the undertaker at Hates, this is Hanky. And you notice that he, by then, they had black baby dolls available. In the older picture with, with uh, Miss May, she was holding a white baby doll because that's all that was available. And then all the Norris kids grew up, just like the, at the um, Pfeiffer's Corner Schoolhouse. They grew up, they moved away, and when mom and dad passed, you know, the house was just abandoned and pretty much was falling to ruin. The porch had fallen off. The windows we actually found in the basement. I don't know why they'd been removed and brought down there. But then the elements got in, so the inside was pretty bad. Um, seeds from trees seem to have like lodged themselves along the foundation, so we had a lot of big old trees we had to take out. And this was kind of what the ceiling looked like. And then in 1976, HUD tore down all the, I say, simple houses. They were basically shacks. There had never been any running water or any electricity up in that community. And so HUD came through, tore them down, and built these townhouse, um, very basic townhouses for the families up there to live in. And then, of course, you know, they were going to tear down the schoolhouse also. Well, people in the community said, no, that building is too important. It was the difference between ignorance and enlightenment. You cannot tear that down. But yet they did not have the wherewithal or the knowledge of how to go about you know, rescuing it. And every few years, there'd be a new mayor in Sykesville, and he would offer, OK, I'm going to help you people out. I'm going to tear down that old, decrepit school for you. And they would say, oh, no, you're not. And you know, so it just kept um, getting more decrepit, but at least it didn't disappear. Okay, when we started the rehabilitation efforts, there were interior walls. When the family lived there, it had been divided into four rooms. When we took the walls down, uh, you can see that little green, it looks green, it's really gray stripe going up the wall. That showed us what color the wainscoting had been painted. The Maryland Historic Trust said, well, you've got to do paint scrapings and have it analyzed, send it to the Smithsonian place out in West Virginia and get it analyzed. And we said, we can just look at it, it's there. And the same with the teaching stage. There was a ghost on the floor of where the teaching stage had been, so we could see exactly where we had to build the new one. We were very lucky in the restoration that the year 2000 came by, and the state of Maryland was naming 12 treasures in Maryland for each month, and the schoolhouse was Miss February on their calendar. And so we did get money from the sale of the calendar. And around the same time, it was also on the Home and Garden pilgrimage. And so we got a share of that money from the Carroll County um, pilgrimage. And, OK. The Pfeiffer's Corner Schoolhouse, Howard County spent $450,000 to restore it. This one, we did for under 18000 of taxpayer money. 
because people volunteer things, and then we got the money from the pilgrimage and the calendar sale. And again, we had to collect artifacts, and this is kind of a cool story. I was looking online, I was looking at antique shops for old desks, and they were all too ornate with the fancy wrought iron, and I thought, I don't think so in our schoolhouse. Plus, they were close to $100 each, and you know, I wanted a reasonable number of them. And then my daughter said, well, look on eBay. And I go on, and there's somebody selling four desks for the older kids, and four for like the third and fourth graders, and his starting bid was 150. So I contacted him, he said you had to pick them up. So I contacted the seller and said, you know, we want them for the schoolhouse, but if we have to pick them up, can I wait until Sykesville has a truck available, rather than, you know, getting there the day the auction is over? And so he said, um, give me your phone number. And he called me and said, listen, I'm going to change it to a buy it now. I want you to have these. So stay by your computer, and as soon as you see buy, buy it now, buy it now, and you can come up and get them whenever you want. And so I bought them now. Oh, and then he said, I have four little ones, too, for the younger kids. But my wife wanted those, but you need them more than she did. So he um, said for another hundred, I could have those, and he wasn't keeping the money himself. For many years, he had been going to a school that was built in 1904, just like our schoolhouse, a school for girls in Pittsburgh, a, girls, a school that had been built, for, a Catholic school for girls of color. And he would go over there to help the nuns on his day off. Well, one day they wanted him to bring something up to the attic, and we, he went up there and there were hundreds of desks. Some 1950s style, but some of the old ones with very simple wrought iron. So for several years, he'd been selling them one at a time on eBay. He finally got tired of it. He put on the last eight all at once. That was the day I happened to go on. And then he ended up selling me the rest with the money going to the, the nuns for their school. So that was great. And then he said, listen, I want to see your school. I'll drive them out to Sykesville. So I'm, we brought the desks to my barn because the schoolhouse wasn't done yet. And we're standing out there, and I'm going to write him his check. And his last name is Lejda, L-E-J-D-A. And I said, that's an unusual name. What nationality is it? And he said, well, it's Swedish. And I said, oh, I'm Swedish. I'm a Berquist. And he said, you know, what part of Sweden? And well, I can't remember the name of the town. Anyway, it was the town my grandfather came from. And he said, well, that's where his grandfather was from. And I said, what did, year did your grandfather come? 1910? Yeah, mine came in 1910. And then he said, um, I said, was your grandfather a jeweler? And he said, how did you know that? And I said, he made my ring. And when my grandfather's business, he was a building contractor, when he became successful, at that time a woman's success was defined as her children. So he designed a ring with three diamonds for each of his daughters for my grandmother, and he had his friend in Pittsburgh. My grandfather had gone into Illinois with the rest of the Swedes by then, but he had his friend in Pittsburgh make the ring for him. And so then we went up to my computer and we looked on Ancestry.com where I had put the, the list of the people on the ship with my grandfather, and sure enough, he and my grandfather were sharing a room. So, so <laughs> we had lots of things like that happen in this in this restoration. There's kind of an aura around the schoolhouse. And this makes it look like that restoration was so easy. It was not. I mean, there were many months of hard work between the pictures you saw and this. But this is my husband installing the pot-bellied stove. That, you know, the kids warmed themselves by. And in September of 2006, we dedicated it to the students and teachers who had learned within its walls. And since then, okay, this is what the interior looks like with the desks. On the far side, we have modern chairs and modern tables for when we have modern kids in there. The flag was another neat story. I've been looking for a 
45 star flag and they were pretty pricey and I hadn't found one yet and the night before our dedication, it was late, you know, about nine o'clock, it was dark out, and there were lights that came up the way to the building. And then I saw two elderly men get out of a car and come walking up with a heavy package. I thought, what is this? Well, I had spoken at Fairhaven about our efforts to restore the schoolhouse. One of the men there had a collection of every flag that had ever flown over the U.S. None of his children wanted his flags. And so he had been trying to give it to us, but he didn't know how to reach me. Whenever he had an opportunity, he'd come over there, and he happened to come that night. The lights were on, they came up. The flag is so heavy, we had to reinforce the wall behind it before we could hang it. But we got our 45-star flag. We had to put another door in because modern kids have to be safe in case of fire. And we've, at first we were mainly having school field trips, but the kids just don't go on field trips the way they used to. They're very, very few. There's so much standardized testing that they're kind of stuck in the classroom most days. So we didn't have a lot of field trips, maybe one or two a month at the most. And that's Warren Dorsey speaking with the kids. And then we would help scout troops with their badges and patches. And again, it was maybe one a month, one every second month. Homeschool groups would come, which was kind of like getting back to what it had been. We'd have little kids, and then we'd have the older kids all at once. And we finally told the homeschoolers they had to come as a group of them, because I would have one mom calling and wanting to bring one child, and it was taking up a lot of time, so I finally said, get, your, you know, get a little group, and that's fine. And then our A-plus graduates were wonderful at um, helping out whenever we had field trips. That's Rosie Dorsey Hutchinson, her sister May, and then her brother Warren Dorsey. And they're in the same positions. May and Warren are in the same positions that they were in that picture of them as little children. And then in addition to the, the daytime things of, for, for the community, once every second month, we would have a community open house for kids and families where the kid, there'd be a theme and the kids would come in, work on that theme and always make a couple of things to bring home. Community organizations also used it. We only charged $35, which I guess was a bargain. And uh, this is a garden club. A garden club from Frederick that came all the way to Sykesville to use us. Well, this I put in just it was my book club, and they'd read Warren Dorsey's book, and then Warren came to discuss the book with them. Warren and his sister Rosie and nephew. And then, in September 2015, our pastor at St. Um, Paul's United Methodist Church on Main Street in Sykesville had us read this book on the five practices of fruitful congregations. One of the chapters was risk-taking missions. So I fell asleep that night thinking, what could I do that would be a risk-taking mission? Well, I'm a retired middle school teacher. I could go to the middle school and volunteer after school tutoring. But how would the kids get home afterwards? And then I had one of those two o'clock aha moments when I woke up at 2 a.m. and went, just a second, I'm coordinator of a one-room schoolhouse that lives in the middle of some that sits in the middle of subsidized housing. The kids who need the tutoring the most are the kids in that community. Why not have it after school there? And I had also been frustrated that we were only using the schoolhouse maybe three or four times a month max, and it just didn't seem worth you know, all the heat and the water and everything that we were paying for. So we started our homework club which meets at the schoolhouse every Monday and Wednesday. The middle schoolers get off their bus at three. The elementary kids come at four. Um, right before the pandemic, we had 22 kids. We tried to do one-on-one, -on -one, but we couldn't get that many bodies in there to have 22 tutors. So most of them were tutoring two kids at that time. After the pandemic, we're down to just 14 for this coming year. A lot of the families could not afford the subsidized housing and had to come up to either the homeless shelter or to live on people's couches. Um, 
Okay, we tutor kids from kindergarten through middle school, and we tried having the, con the um, high school kids come in to get their service learning hours as tutors, but they kind of considered it their social hours, so if I wanted to keep the tutors, I had to stop that. Um, but we work closely with their counselors, who have also recommended kids who do not live in that community, who then get permission to ride the bus to the schoolhouse road community so that they can do a whole lot of And we always try to get one-on-one. -on -one. We're all set with one-on-one -on -one for this coming year. And when the kids come, they get a healthy snack. We usually give them some pure juice that really is juice, um, some kind of a starch, and then some kind of fruit. And you know, they all tell us, we don't like pineapples, and then they taste a real pineapple. And, this doesn't taste like the pineapple in the can they suddenly like pineapple. But then we help them with their homework. If they don't have any homework, which particularly the middle schoolers like to say, but you know, we can go online and see what they have. The teachers post the homework. Um, but then we'll do drills and games with them. And you've not had a lot of fun until you've watched a bunch of middle schoolers play Candyland because they never played it when they were little kids. And they get these real cutthroat games of Candyland. Um, and then we also have enrichment activities. We try to get some African-American role models to come in and speak who are not um, you know, basketball stars or singers, but people who have attainable careers. And we also do a lot of crafts and science activities, music activities. And then Homework Club started taking over a lot of the real estate. Before Homework Club, it looked like a well-preserved one-room schoolhouse. And now it's kind of a mess. But when Warren Dorsey was still with us, he said, this is great. It looks more like it looked when it was a school, when there were things all over. And particularly during the pandemic, everybody was cleaning their kids' bookshelves. So I had to keep going out and buying more and more bookshelves for the Homework Club. There's actually one more set there now. Just a few pictures of the tutors at work. Another anachronism is the computers, but you cannot do tutoring and homework with kids without computers now. So we have um, two nice Lenovas, and then we have six, um, what are they called, Chromebooks. Well, this was kind of funny. We had George and Abe on the back wall. You see them up there in the frames, the Courier and I've prints. Well, the kids wanted to know why we didn't have Barack Obama up there. And I said, well, okay, let's write a letter. So one of the girls wrote the letter. We took this picture and sent it with the letter, asking him if we could have a photograph to put on the wall. We sent it in September. I didn't hear anything, and shortly, before he left office, I saw an article in the Washington Post that said he was getting 12,000 letters a day. 10 were making it to his desk, and the rest were just being looked at by staff. And so I told the kids, you know, chances are we were one of the 12,000 and we're just not going to hear anything. Well, the day that Obama was leaving office, my phone rang while I was having breakfast, and, it's, and on the TV, Obama is writing his letter to leave for, for um, Donald Trump in the Resolute desk. The phone rings, and it's the secretary from over at the townhouse, and she said, we've just had a delivery from the White House, and it's addressed to you. Can you come over here? Because we want to know what's in it. And so I went on over there. We got a box, and it included um, the photo, signed photograph of Obama, and then one of the whole family, and then a photograph of each of their dogs, and one of the dogs had um, the dog's bios on the back, really funny little bios of each of the dogs. Um, we had books about the White House, children-appropriate books about the White House and how it functioned, one about the presidency, and I did one of these on the letter. And it was signed in ink. I don't, can't guarantee Obama himself signed it. But the neatest thing was the letter, where he told the kids of his own simple beginnings, and if they 
uh, persevered and kept a positive attitude and were kind to themselves and others. You know, they could make it out of the circumstances in which they currently were. And so we made a copy of that for each of the kids. And I go into the townhouses over there now and I see it framed on walls along with the picture. Okay, I said we'd do enrichment activities last thing. This is the former pastor of St. St. Paul's, um, Perry, Ray, Perry Ray Chapman, who started out life as a music teacher. Here the kids had read about local birds and made little bird feeders that they were hanging from the trees. We also put in a garden in an attempt to maybe improve nutrition in the community. The kids plant it and then we invite everybody to come and pick and they better get over there today because the tomatoes are pulling the plants down. And then we have a little flower garden also and Lyons is just in the process of donating a bench for the flower garden. We also celebrate the holidays and things with parties because it's something that the kids don't have space in their own homes to do. So this is a help from a Halloween party, a Christmas party. Oh, it's become a tradition. Our first Halloween party, we challenged them to work as a team, you know, two kids together, and turn one of them into a ghost with toilet paper. And they thought that was great. So at Thanksgiving, they became white turkeys. And at Christmas, they became snowmen. And OK, last year, we thought, we've done that so many times. So we weren't going to do it. I guess it was at our Valentine's Day party. And the kids said, well, where's the toilet paper? And so we took it out of the bathroom. And they said, never have a party where we don't do that. So that is one of our traditions. And then we give them a Santa sack at Christmas time filled with little things. The town is really good about giving them the big things they want, but we fill their Santa sacks with little things. Another positive thing that we hadn't thought of was most of our tutors are retired teachers from Fairhaven. So we're giving some of the seniors something that they're enjoying doing as well as you know, helping the kids. And they've just been a terrific asset. I mean, they plan you know, all week for what they're going to do with the kids the next time they see them. And we have had a few successful team tutors. Like I said, some of them wanted to just socialize, so we don't have that many. Right now, we're having Wacky Wednesdays, Wednesday mornings, to get the kids out of bed because school is going to be starting soon. All their mothers work in nursing homes, and they're gone before the kids get up. So at least we go from door to door at about 9.30 on Wednesday mornings and get them awake. And then we give them two hours of something themed. Tomorrow, we're talking about good bugs, bad bugs. We're doing sports heroes the next Wednesday. Then the Last Wednesday, we give them each a backpack, which is filled with everything their teachers have on their list of items they want the kids to have. And then we have had some special events. Here we're on a tour of UMBC, just to show the kids what a college is. When Hidden Figures came out, we bought a copy, and we had a pizza party one evening and um, then sat down with popcorn to watch kid and figures. And even the littlest kid stood up when she wasn't allowed to use the bathroom because of her color. And, the little, and then you know, her boss spoke up and she, the kids all stood up and cheered. And we were going to do the same with the um, new Harriet Tubman movie, but that got COVIDed out. And we've had some special events for birthdays. Here the owner of the um, hibachi grill in, on Liberty Road wanted to make a dinner for some of the kids. And so he ended up doing a birthday party for two twins. And the Girl Scout troop in Sykesville get, put up a little free library. Um, lower shelf is books for the kids, upper shelf is books for mama. And they are in constant, constant use. 
Um, you know, people say it's always a mess. Well, yeah, it's a mess because the kids have been taking books out. I don't think any book has ever come back, but the whole community uses it as a place to bring books that their kids aren't reading or they aren't reading. There have been a few books I've had to take out of there because they're a little too risque. But, uh, and then we survived during COVID by masking and t tutoring outside until the weather got too cold. We just moved the tables about 10 feet apart down our long walkway. Funding. Kids are great when they go in and talk at church and uh, the month that we're in mission and they manage to bring in a lot of money. You know, if I speak, you know, some will come, but if the kids speak, it's really good. Um, Rotary has donated a lot of funds over the years and also put in, set a crew and put in the garden, which is now fenced in because there are a lot of deer. And then the Fairhaven Residents Association shocked us when they came to the end of the year picnic a few years ago and gave us a check for $10,000 to be used um, for scholarships. And we've interpreted scholarships as Okay, we give one every year to a senior, $1,000, but we also give them to pay athletic fees if some of the kids want to do high school sports. We've also bought running shoes for some of the kids, music lessons, uh, summer camps, the programs, the kids on campus at the community college in the summer. And one girl is determined she's going to become a doctor and she was, had really high SAT scores, so she was selected for a summer program um, this past summer. And so we bought her her scrubs and paid her tuition for that summer program at the University of Maryland. And then a year later, Fairhaven gave us another 10,000, so our scholarship fund is very well endowed. And when Warren Dorsey passed away, his family asked that donations be made to the Homework Club Scholarship Fund instead of flowers. So again, we were able to add to that fund. And um, we decided, therefore, the scholarship would be named the Warren Dorsey Scholarship. And this is Renee Nash, who was our very first recipient. It was still called Homework Club Scholarship at that point. But um, the kids, Homework Club Scholarship, yeah. But the Warren Dorsey Scholarship, he has become such a legend in their community that they all want to get the Warren Dorsey Scholarship. And Renee, because we didn't have a recipient um, this past year, we did give Renee a thousand for each semester. And she is at um, Allegheny College of Maryland. And my final thought, if there's another schoolhouse out there that needs restoration, please don't tell me about it. <laughs> we have about two more minutes before 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock if anybody has a question. And I have a microphone here, Pat. Yeah, okay. Have people speak into the mic. Okay, Any anybody more? have anything? Back here. Sure, and Pat, you could say a few words too about your exhibit oh, in the back. Yeah, I just um, put up a couple of things back there. It's some more pictures of the schoolhouse, the Sykesville schoolhouse. There's also some little cards that are invitations to the Children's Museum, if you have any children in your life you'd like to bring. Or if any of you live close enough that you'd like to docent at the museum, there's also a sheet there about how you can get in touch with us and become a docent. So we have a question here. What, what credentials do you require your tutors for the uh, homework club, and do you need more tutors? The only credential we require is that they care. And, okay, most of these kids are never one-on-one -on -one with an adult. One family, mom is about to have the ninth child. And they just don't have that one-on-one -on -one time and the relationship becomes pretty close between the tutor and the child. Um, and at school, you know, the teacher might have 24 kids. Well, you know, they don't get one-on-one -on -one there either. Right now, I think we're okay for this year, but, you know, we pick up one more child and we're gonna need another tutor. So, 
And I think there is, might be one more that we're about to pick up. So if you're interested, see me or write down your contact information and put it over on the table there and we will get back with you. Because last year we were desperate for two more tutors for a while. Okay, anything else? Anyone else? Well, Pat, thank you very, very much for your great talk today and for coming out and visiting with us. Thanks again. Thank you. I was here many years ago when you were over at the um, American Legion to talk about our hopes to restore the Sykesville Schoolhouse. And then I came one other time with Warren and Rosie Dorsey, and they were speaking about the schoolhouse. So I'm sure this was a repeat for some of you. Thank you.